Last time we met, I announced that we're going to be talking in the next series of meetings uh, uh, on the subject of relationships. This is something that is actually the central theme of Christianity, uh, and yet it's not always talked about, at least not always biblically. I think a lot of the large churches might touch on things related to relationships just because, that's, because people are interested in that. Uh, I think we need to talk about it whether people are interested or not. Sometimes they're not interested in learning the things that the Bible actually says about it. They'd rather learn from self-help gurus and things like that, how to make their relationships happy. Uh, we should be mostly concerned about how to make our relationships pleasing to God. They may be happy or not as happy as one could imagine, but if they're pleasing to God, that's what makes a Christian happy. Uh, you, want to, you don't want to be happy with something less than what is pleasing to God in your life, even if you could arrange things to be so. Um, last time uh, we had an introduction to the whole subject of relationships. And uh, at the end of that time, there were a couple of verses that we covered that I just want to use to launch into what we have to say today. Uh, one of those was Romans chapter 12, verse 18, where Paul said, if it is possible, as much as lies in you, live at peace with all people. So living at peace, that's, the kind, that's God's goal for our relationships, is to live a peaceable life, to be at peace with others. And, uh, and of course, to be serviceable, that is loving, helpful, uh, you know, useful to others too. But you can't really do much of that if you're not at peace with them. And there's so many broken relationships uh, between people in churches they used to go to, perhaps, between people who used to be married to each other or who still are and are not at peace with each other, between persons and ex-friends, uh, uh, maybe with their parents, maybe with their children. There's a lot of different relationships. Uh, and most of them, uh, at least almost everybody I know, has some where things are not at, at, at peace as they should be. And yet Paul said, if it's possible... As much as lies in you, and indicating that it's not always necessarily possible, and it doesn't all lie in you. Part of it is on the other side. But he said, be at peace or live at peace with all people. So this should certainly be our goal, to be at peace with everyone if possible. But, of course, one reason it's not always possible is because we need to be at peace in a righteous manner. You can keep everyone happy with you if you're just a, a, a people pleaser. And being a people pleaser is not what the Bible is recommending. Uh, we're supposed to have an impact on the world. And that means that we sometimes have to confront things that need to be changed. And that is often displeasing to other people. Sometimes it's even displeasing to us to have to do that. We'd rather not. But uh, that's nonetheless part of our commission is to make disciples. And making disciples means we have to confront people about things that need to change in their lives uh, based on what Jesus said. And what Jesus said more than anything else was about relationships. Almost the entire Sermon on the Mount is about relationships. Almost all the, the things that Jesus repeated most often in his ministry were about relationships. Of course, our relationship with God, a very major one, but it's surprising once you go looking to realize that he probably said more that has to do with uh, managing relationships with people than directly with God. And that's partly because our relationship with God depends on how committed we are to our relationship with people. As John said, whoever does not love his brother whom he has not seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he that loveth God, love his brother also. Uh, you can't, uh, we can all talk about loving God, uh, but loving people is really the test. Do you love who God loves, really? Uh, and so, God has a lot to say about living at peace. Now, we also saw last time uh, a verse at the end of Psalm 120, actually two verses, verses uh, 6 and 7, where the psalmist said, Woe is me that I dwell in Meshech, that I dwell among the tents of Kedor. My soul has dwelt too long with one who hates peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. 
Uh, which is what Paul meant when he said, as much as lies in you, live at peace, if it's possible with all people. Not everyone wants peace. Not everyone wants peace on righteous terms. They might be glad to have peace, meaning you have to agree with them. You have to put, do what pleases them. And, uh, and, and you're not required to do what pleases them. You're, I mean, you should if, it's, if, it is, if it isn't compromising. If it's a matter of choosing to please them rather than just please yourself, then it's a virtuous thing to please others. Uh, and to lay down your rights, but but if it's a matter of having to please people by compromising and they don't like what you stand for, well, then obviously uh, you're not going to be able to please them. You're not going to win them over. And they, you might want to be at peace with them. You might not even be trying to force anything on them, but they just don't want you to take the position you take at all. And they're for war, unless you're going to come around to their way of looking at it. Now, in Isaiah chapter 59, in verse 8, a, a scripture that Paul actually quotes in Romans 3, where he's talking about how wicked people are. Uh, Paul quotes uh, quite a few verses from Psalms and, and this one from Isaiah in a block of scriptures in uh, Romans chapter 3, talking just about how bad people can be. And in this verse, he says, The way of peace they have not known, and there's no justice in their ways. They've made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes the way shall not know peace. There's a way you can live that is not the way of peace. Uh, there are many people who don't know the way of peace. There's a way to live that maintains peace, generally speaking, uh, with exceptions of people who just are ordinary and don't want to have peace. But the point is that you can be at peace with most people if you know the way, the way of living peaceably. And that's what we want to talk about today. Um, you can see in your notes, I've got like 15 points. You, you, sermons usually have three points, so, uh, and you know how long I usually talk. But this is, I'm not going to talk about any more of these than we can fit in naturally. And, um, and we can save some for another time. Or I could just be very brief about them. But these are points I put together some time ago when I was studying Romans 12. Uh, Romans 12, I would describe as a relationships chapter. Not all of these points are in Romans 12, but you'll see that. Romans 12 is pretty disproportionately uh, represented in the, in the references. But we also have quite a few references from Proverbs, which is a book of, full of wisdom about relationships. And, of course, we have some from other places, too, including the Sermon on the Mount. So, but, I mean, we could draw from all over the Scripture uh, to talk about relationships and the way of living peaceably with somebody, uh, or re living responsibly at peace with somebody. Um, and a lot of this has to do with the attitudes we have. Uh, then, of course, a lot of it has to do with the behavior, too. If you behave well towards somebody, but your attitude is bad toward them, and you're just trying to conceal that, uh, they'll, many times they'll be able to pick that up. You can be smiling, but if you really resent them, then they can pick that up. So you have to have your heart right, obviously. You have to love your neighbor as you love yourself, which means that your your heart is devoted to treating them as well as you wish to be treated yourself. But then, of course, it's manifested in doing that which is good for them, uh, doing what you would want done to you, as, the, as Jesus said in Matthew 7 and 12. Now, I'm just going to go through a list of things that I get from these passages. As I said, I began with uh, Romans 12 when I first put this list together, but there's some, some of the points don't have any, uh, anything in Romans 12 about them, but they're just kind of branches off of, of other points. Uh, let's talk first of all about esteeming others better than yourself. Now we live at a time where uh, for many decades now, everybody has been told that what we need is more self-esteem. We've told that the prisons are full of people who are there because they lack self-esteem and therefore they do criminal things. Uh, we, we find many people saying that the reason that your relationships are bad is because you don't love yourself. You don't esteem yourself well. And, uh, you know, you don't put up your boundaries or something. You know, they've got all kinds of psycho psychological talk about relationships that insist that you need to make sure that you esteem yourself first or love yourself first. I remember the first time I heard somebody say uh, this back probably in the 70s, early 70s. Uh, they said, you know, Jesus said you have to love yourself because you can't love others until you love yourself. <laughs> 
They say that Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And they saw that as a command to love yourself. Uh, I remember hearing that and thinking, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> Jesus didn't command anyone to love themselves. He assumed they do. Paul said in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, no man yet ever hated his own flesh, but it nourishes and cherishes it. Uh, people love themselves by nature. Jesus didn't say, learn to love yourself, learn to esteem yourself, learn to do right by yourself. That's your, that's your carnal inclination anyway. Mm. I mean, that's what you do from birth. That's, your, that's what you want to do. You don't need to be told to do that. Jesus said, love your neighbor in the way that you already and naturally love yourself. Now, by the way, if Jesus thought people didn't love themselves enough, then he shouldn't tell us to love other people the way we love ourselves because we don't love ourselves very well. And, uh, you know, he should have picked a higher bar than love as you love yourself. But, of course, he assumed you love yourself. He assumed that the natural tendency is to put yourself first. And to esteem others better than yourself is not the natural way to do things. In Romans 12.10, Paul said, Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honor giving preference to the other. Prefer the other one. Prefer to honor their request, to honor their needs, their wishes, if possible, over your own. Now, that doesn't mean you, you never get what you need, but it means you don't care too much about whether you get what you need. You're more concerned that, well, your orientation, if you love someone as you love yourself, you know how you, you know what you would like, and you're pretty much eager that they would get what, what they like and what you assume they would like because you know what you would like. That's, that's esteeming them and saying, well, both of us would like to have this one item, but there's only one to go between us. So uh, you, please take it. You take this chair. You take the last piece. You do this thing. You have your way. Uh, I knew someone uh, in Youth with a Mission. Two, two women shared a, a, a room, and one of them could not sleep with the window shut, and the other could not sleep with the window open, and they had to share a room. Now, I think some married couples probably face that too, uh, you know. Uh, but people sometimes are that way. You just can't have it both. Uh, having it half open doesn't work for anyone. If someone can't sleep with it open, have it half open, it's not going to be good. If someone can't sleep with it shut, and it has to be all the way open, they'll probably not be happy with it half open. So what do you do? I mean, it's a, a crisis. It's a dilemma. What do you do when somebody can't sleep with the window shut and some can't sleep with the window open. Well, you obviously go to separate rooms. Or, if you want to stay in the same room, one person can say, why don't you have it your way? Uh, you know, I can adjust. I can learn. Now, that might feel, sound like you're making yourself a doormat. And that's always something we're told we should never do. Now, you don't ever want to make yourself a doormat. Women are especially told this, especially, you know, in modern marriage counseling. You don't want to become a doormat. Well, I don't think any woman has been a literal doormat before. But if it means don't let people walk on you, then that sounds like what Jesus actually did. He did let people walk on him. When he was, they struck him in the face, he didn't strike back. When he, when he was uh, suffered, he didn't threaten, it says in 1 Peter chapter 2. Um, he just committed himself to him who judges righteously. This is the point. Jesus just committed himself to God and did what was the kind thing, the loving thing, the considerate thing, the beneficial thing for the other person. Now, it doesn't mean he was just Mr. Nice Guy. I remember one of my older sons, well, one of my sons when he got older in life, I should say, uh, he read a book. It's still out there. It's a psychology book, not Christian, called uh, No More Mr. Nice Guy. And he, and he came to me and he said, uh, he said, Dad, you need to read this book. You, you know, he says, this describes our family, meaning him and me and, and everyone. And I, I thought, well, I'll take a look at it, see what you're reading. And, you know, basically the guy was writing saying, you know, people who are nice, people who accommodate others, are, you know, they already they have some kind of psychological, you know, problem they need to get over. I thought, well, uh, they're, they're just trying to please people is what they're, he said. And I, I could imagine that being true of many people. They're just people pleasers. They, they, don't, they don't want anyone to get mad at them. They don't want anyone not to like them. So they just are wimpy and just, uh, you know, uh, give in all the time to people and never have any backbone. I, there are people like that, I know. There are people like that. But that's not what I think of when I think about being kind and, and giving up my rights for people. I just see, see it as I'm in the strong position. 
I can, I can be happy not getting my way. Apparently you can't. You know, if, if the other person can't be happy without getting their way, and there's no sin in them having their way, I'm okay with that. You know, I mean, when it comes to having convictions about what you should do or shouldn't do, you should never compromise those. But giving up your preferences is not a problem. And sometimes that's just a kind thing to do. Now, if you're doing it because you are a weak person, in the sense that you don't have any convictions, you don't have any backbone, you don't have any courage, and you're afraid people will, you know, not like you, and you can't stand people not liking you, well, then obviously you do have an issue. You don't have problems. Uh, but Jesus didn't have that problem. Jesus didn't think little of himself. He just felt that he should lay down his throne in heaven to come down here and take on the form of a servant. And to, and to humble himself to the point of death of the cross, Philippians 2 tells us. You know, Jesus, when he washed his disciples' feet, it was offensive to his disciples because he's doing what servants do. And he's not the servant, he's the master. Of course, he had to tell them, the Son of Man, in another place, he said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. And he said, that's what you need to be like. The, who, he that will be chief among you is going to be the one who serves everybody, like the Son of Man. But when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, and Peter objected, and, but finally Jesus talked him into it, Jesus said to the disciples, you call me Master and Lord, and you're right, because I am. But if I, your Master and Lord, have washed your feet, then you need to wash each other's feet. Now what's interesting here is that he didn't say, I'm not your Master, don't, don't elevate me like that, you know, I'm nothing. No, he is something, he is everything, he's, he's the Master, he's the Lord, he's, he's not saying he's nothing, he's saying, I am everything you think I am. I'm the king. I'm the Lord. Now, I've got enough security to, to wash your feet and not feel like I'm diminished by it. You know, I, I, it doesn't make me think less of who I am to act like a servant to you because I feel like this is beneficial to you. To live for the benefit of others is best done when you actually are a stronger person, when you actually don't need their approval, uh, when you're just looking for God's approval. And that's, that's what it should be, to esteem others better than yourself, to honor others above yourself, as Paul said, is frankly the Christian way. And when people say, well, you need to stand up for yourself too, you don't want to be a, a, a doormat, I think, well, okay, if, if anyone lays me on the ground and starts wiping their feet on me, I guess I'll probably speak up about that. But uh, I, I, I'm not afraid to not get my way. I don't have to get my way all the time. We need to be able to be happy that somebody else is getting their way. When, when my kids were little, we didn't have much money and they'd often be attracted to things that other kids had who did have money, nice things, oh. uh, or, and, or, or maybe animals and stuff that they had that we couldn't get. And uh, I just thought, well, why don't you just enjoy them having it? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you'd probably enjoy having one, but you can even enjoy the fact that they have one. Let them, you know, be happy for them. Uh, little kids, that doesn't go over real well for them, but but uh, made sense to me. <laughs> Every time I see someone who's got something nice, I can't afford to think, well, I'm glad they've got it. I don't need one of those. I don't need anything. Having food and raiment with these will be content, Paul said. But I can be glad. There's even things people have that are nice that I like. And then if I had one, it wouldn't bother me to have one. But I just think, no, I don't need it. Uh, let them have it. We need to be people who are quite... Uh, modest in our demands and, and our uh, things that we think we need because then we can surrender or defer to others and we might have to stretch ourselves too like if you think you can't sleep with the window closed and your spouse has to sleep with the window closed well then you may stretch yourself because you know that that'll give them a better night's sleep uh, or you can't sleep that way you have to sleep in another room maybe uh, in chapter 2 of Philippians, chapter 3, Paul spoke about this same matter when he said, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each esteem others. That's, that's the only statement about self-esteem that I find in the Bible, uh, where you have self and esteem, esteem in the same verse. Let each esteem the other better than himself. So uh, do I have to have high or low self-esteem? Well, whether I have high or low, I need to make sure that I esteem you better than me. 
I can I can think well of myself. I mean, if that's an appropriate way to think, if I'm a good person, no reason for me to you know shame myself and tell myself I'm bad. But to think that I'm deserving of anything because of it is is really the, where we go wrong. Think you know you're no better than me. Why should you get your way? You know. Well, I, I could say I could say well, I don't think you're any better than me. But why don't you have your way? Uh, Steve, yes. Well, wouldn't you say that if we see ourselves as God sees us in Christ, that that takes care of the self-esteem problem? Yes, yes. I mean, I had a friend who was very humble. Everyone knew him to be a very humble man. And I asked him once, you know, how do you, uh, you know, he was very respected. He was in the ministry. I, I, I had a good friendship with him, so I got to talk with him privately a lot. I said, you know, you, everyone admires how humble you are. And you know they do. I mean, they've mentioned a lot. How do you stay humble like that? And he said, well, he said, it, you, always, you always are comparing yourself with others. He said, it depends on who you compare yourself with. If you compare yourself with other people, sometimes you feel like you measure up pretty good and you can feel pretty good about yourself. You can, it might make you feel a little proud. But he says, if, if who you're comparing yourself with is Jesus, you'll never feel proud. You'll never feel like you've measured up to that. And when you keep in mind how God views us and the standard that God uses to measure people, which is Christ, then obviously it's, you'd be more naturally put in your place, I suppose. Even, even if you have a very, you know, if you feel good about yourself. There's no reason a Christian can't feel good about themselves if they're not sinning, you know, if you're living a righteous life, if, you've, if, if things are going well, God's using you. Why shouldn't you feel good about that? Uh, you don't have to fake some kind of humility by saying, oh, I'm, I'm not nothing, you know, I, I, I'm not worth anything. Well, no, you are worth something. Now, it's interesting that Paul made this statement in Romans 7, in me, that is in my flesh, there dwells no good thing, right? We all know that verse. In me, that is in my flesh, there dwells no good thing. That sounds pretty humble. I mean, maybe self-depreciating, self-deprecating. But in Philemon chapter 1, verse 6, Philemon only has one chapter, Paul, uh, Paul is praying for Philemon, and he says, I'm praying that the sharing of your faith may become effective. That is, that your, your fellowship interaction with the saints and with others will become effective. I want you to be effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Now, wait, are there good things in me or are there not good things? Paul said, in me and my flesh, there's no good thing. But Paul says, you need to acknowledge every good thing that's in you, in Christ. If you're thinking of yourself simply as yourself in the flesh, there's not much you can be proud about at all. In fact, you shouldn't be proud about anything, even if you acknowledge the things that are good things in you in Christ. But there are good things in you in Christ. Your flesh didn't contribute them. Being in Christ, Christ has made you something. Christ has given you gifts. Christ has changed your life. Christ has improved you. Christ has made you significant because he is significant and his movement is significant and you've, you've got a significance in the world. You should live in this world with a sense of importance, with a sense of significance, with a sense that you are able to do through Christ whatever he wants you to do. You should acknowledge every good thing that's in you in Christ. Mm -hmm. But that, 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 that will never make you proud if you're realizing these are good things in me in Christ. That means it's him that's good. I share in them by being in him. But in my flesh, there's no good thing. So, I mean, self-esteem, it's a tricky thing. We can't go into it in, in much detail. But, um, you know, some people say we have to have high. Some people say we have to have low self-esteem. Well, it depends. If you're thinking of myself as, you know, who I am by nature, my natural abilities and talents or whatever and, and goodness, uh, there's nothing to be proud about there. We should think very low of our flesh, Paul did. And, uh, and yet, our flesh isn't all there is to us. We're in Christ now. And therefore, we should recognize, hey, there are people who are being helped by what I do. There are people who are blessed. I am bringing people to the Lord and so forth. I mean, all of you have, can see that in some parts of your life, some aspects of your life. And, and you should think well of that. But while you do, you should also esteem others better than yourself. And by that, I think what he means, the same as what he said in honor preferring one another, is that 
you're not really evaluating, is that a better person than me? Do I think they're better than me or me better than them? It's rather you don't even think about that. <laughs> Why would you even think about that? It means that you treat them as if their needs, their preferences are as important as yours. Maybe more so to you. More important to you that their happiness is served than your own. And this is not, uh, this is not being codependent. This is not being a doormat. This is simply being like Christ. Um, and yet they do make up terms like codependent for people who are like that. To make it sound like it's, a, it's some kind of a sickness to be like that. You've know, you got to stand up for yourself, put up your boundaries and so forth. There is a place for boundaries. I'm not saying there's not. I'm saying that when you begin to make it your goal to look out for your own rights, to, uh, to pump up your own self-esteem, then I think you're going to be having problems in relationships because, you know, everyone else has been told to do the same thing and everyone's going to think they deserve what they... You know, when two people think they deserve the same thing, there's going to be conflict until one of them says, you know, I, I'd rather you had it, frankly. I'd rather this was yours because I, I don't need that to make me happy. I've got something else to fulfill me. The, the, you, also in terms of your attitude towards someone, besides uh, esteeming them better than yourself, is of course what Paul said when he's talking about love in Romans 13, 7. And where he said, of course, love believes all things, hopes all things. What does it mean to believe all things? Does it mean you're gullible? No, since it's, it's a description of love, it has to do with how you are toward people. That you, No doubt it means you believe the best about them. It's in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 7. That you believe, the way I would put it, and that makes sense, is that you believe the best thing about a person that the evidence will permit or that the facts will permit. You know, uh, you don't just meet somebody and think, you know, they're a bad person until you get some kind of a reason for that. Now, you might get an instinct about that, and it may be correct. Or you may have discovered from interacting with them they're, they're unreliable or they're, you know, they're not safe people or whatever. Then you have to, of course, think what's true. But until you know something bad about someone, your, your default should be uh, you want to believe them. And again, not gullibly, not like you ignore the facts, but you want to believe the best about someone. And many times we surrender the best opinion of somebody that we could have with no good reason to surrender that. Usually it's because we've heard something about them that has not been verified. That's what we call gossip. Um, now, sometimes what you hear about somebody will be true. But when you hear something about somebody and you don't know it to be true, then until you do know it's true, you should be cautious about listening to such gossip. Again, listening to gossip or even gossiping yourself. These are th the Bible says you know, the words of a tale bear are like tasty trifles. They go into the innermost parts of the belly, it says in Proverbs, which is uh, to say it, they're tempting. It's tempting to listen to gossip. That's why so many gossip magazines sell at the markets. They make a lot of money on those. They don't have there just to decorate the checkout stand. They're there to make money, and they make a lot of money. They've been doing it for decades, obviously. As long as we've been alive, they've had these gossip magazines. And why would anyone buy them? Well, they, they, they want to hear something, preferably something dirty, about somebody else. They want to know what dirt there is on other people. Well, that's not really, that's not the attitude to have toward people. The way I see it, gossip is uh, when you speak about somebody who's not present in a negative way, and you're speaking to somebody that has no business knowing. That is, they are not part of the problem, so they don't have to be addressed to do what they're supposed to do to fix it. And uh, they're not part of the solution. So if someone is not part of the problem and not part of the solution, they don't need to be involved in it, and you don't need to talk to them. Jesus made it very clear. You go to somebody personally who's done something wrong privately first. You don't make it any more public than they require it to be made. If they don't listen to you the first time, then you bring two or three witnesses. That's still a pretty small group and hopefully reliable people who won't spread the gossip around. But obviously, if he doesn't hear them, then you, you make it public. Some things have to become public, but 
we should have a desire not to publicize things that embarrass other people or that will make others who don't know them think badly of them by default. And we know, we hear things about people that are negative and we don't know them to be true necessarily. I mean, and therefore we, we shouldn't listen to them. Now, uh, in Proverbs about this very matter of gossip, in Proverbs 26, 20, I've given you more verses than just this in there, but I'm not going to cover them all because of the time it takes. Uh, in Proverbs 26, 20, it says, where there is no wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no tail bearer, and that's Solomon's word for a gossip, the strife ceases. So it's like, strife is like a fire. It needs to be fed. It needs to be fueled. If you don't put wood in a fire, the fire goes out. If you don't have a tail bearer or gossip around, the strife eventually goes out. Strife can be stirred up and fueled by gossip. It's the tail bearer. <coughs> my, uh, my friend Danny Lehman, years ago, back in the 70s, I heard t- talking about cutting off the tail of the tail bearer. And uh, he was talking about how to respond when someone's gossiping. I remember a, a preacher that I used to listen to a lot uh, on, on cassette tapes back when I listened to cassette tapes a lot. He was saying he and another minister were walking together out in the church parking lot, and one of them began to t- talk something about another minister who wasn't there. And this one telling the story said, oh, well, we better go talk to him right now about this. Let's go find him, <laughs> you know. And then, then the guy who was gossiping decided it wasn't really that important. But... Uh, that's that's when we just cut off the tail of the tail there. Someone someone talks to you about somebody that's not hey, hey let's call them right now. We'll talk. We need to need, need to get this fixed. You know, let's let's talk about it to them. You'll find many times gossips will give up gossiping, at least to you, <laughs> if you're going to have that kind of a policy. Or you can just start saying real good things about that person. You could do that if they're true. Yeah, if they're true. I you know I, I a story I told about some friends in Santa Cruz were at a coffee shop when I was there. And we were uh, at a table, a bunch of us. And one of the guys started talking about a, another guy who wasn't there. And I knew, the, I knew the guy he was talking about, and so did most of the guys there, but I didn't know him very well. But, um, but this guy just started talking about some things that the guy had done and, and irritations he had with him and so forth. And, and someone spoke up and said, you know, since that man is not here, I'd rather not hear anything about him uh, unless he's here to defend himself. Now that's, that, that cut off, the, the gossip stopped right there. It cut off the tail of the tail there. Uh, another story I've, I've told, I tell these stories because they're good examples of this stuff. Uh, once some friends of mine in Orange County went to hear a, a particular musician who was uh, a Christian musician, but he had some, I guess there's some carnality in his life that was rumored and so forth. And after the concert, a bunch of us were sitting around in the living room and talking, and most of the people were in, you know, saying things they'd heard about this person, and uh, all negative things. And one of the girls that was there was silent the whole time until she finally said, well, I wonder how you guys talk about me when I'm not here. Which is actually not a bad thing to wonder, you know? <laughs> if they'll talk about this person when he's not here, what will they say about me when I'm not here? But when she said that, boy, that just, that stop the gossip right away. I mean, in a sense, there's a place for shaming the person who's bringing the gossip. You can shame on them. They shouldn't, if, if they know something about someone, I don't need to know about it necessarily. Why don't they go talk to that person about it? And if they do talk to that person about it, maybe it'll get resolved. If it doesn't, maybe I'll have to learn about it at some point if, I, if that person's interacting with me and I have to know something about it. But the point is that when you esteem others better than yourself, you try to give them the benefit of the doubt. You try to think the best of them that you can until, you know, until the facts come out and you have to think badly of them because they are bad. But gossip is really uh, something that you, sh- you must not only avoid doing, but avoid listening to. I mean, gossip is so commonplace. That there'd be a big change in many Christians' behavior if whenever they gossiped, someone would say, you know, I don't need to hear that. Thanks. I, they're not here. Why don't we go talk to them about this? Or why don't you go talk to them? I mean, you can say it kinder than that, but the point is you can, I mean, that's the message that you've got to get across. And frankly, that is the message that everyone has to get across. When I, 
when you think about it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Do to others what you want done to you. I mean, when you hear the conversation in a room, start talking about someone who's not there, begin to say, now if I was that person, or I was not here myself, and they were talking about me and saying these very things about me, but hadn't told me that they thought these things, how would I like that? I mean, if, if it's, I mean, that's a good way to ask yourself, is this gossip or is it not gossip? Well, would I like it if they were saying that about me when I wasn't here? Uh, if the answer is no, then that's probably a way of talking about some of that shouldn't be done. Now, there's a really great piece of advice from Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, where um, he's talking about the, you know, the just the general demeanor and lifestyle of the Christians as he advises them to, to live. And he says in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4 and verse 11, Paul says, oh, could, we could, uh, yeah, we urge you, he says in the previous verse, uh, that you aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. To work with your own hands that's good, but the part he says to mind your own business. This is something that is also related to gossip. Most gossip you hear is none of your business. You don't need to hear it. But more than that, the offenses we take to people often are about things that really aren't, shouldn't concern us. Many missionaries, uh, there's, in many mission fields, there's lots of organizations, Christian missionary organizations working. And there's been times when they can be very territorial with each other. Um, you know, these are, these are my converts, or these are your, you know, these are our organization. We're putting those in our statistics, in our newsletter, not yours. And, and, it's, and, they, and they become suspicious of each other, as the missionaries sometimes do. Uh, I don't want to make it sound like all missionaries are like this, but this is a fairly notorious problem in the mission field in many cases. And my father-in-law once was... Uh, a philanthropist, he's dead now, but he, he, uh, he used to take a lot of money down to orphans in Haiti. And uh, he was very popular among the missionaries down there because he'd give a lot of money to them. And once he was at a, like one of their morning devotions or something, they asked him if he'd speak, to, you know, do you have a word for the people here? He said, I just have one word, mind your own business. Uh, because he was so sick of hearing them talk about the other missionaries and what they were doing wrong and, and, and how they were in their territory and so forth. This, uh, just mind your own business. A lot, of, a lot of conflicts happen just because you're not staying in your own lane. You know, you're not minding your business. There's a great proverb about this. Proverbs chapter 26, 17. And when we were going through Proverbs not very long ago, uh, we were talking about wisdom literature, we, we talked about this verse because it's there and it's a good verse. Uh, Proverbs 26 and verse 17. It says, He who passes by and meddles in a quarrel not his own is like one who takes a dog by the ears. You may remember when we talked about that proverb because it paints kind of a graphic picture. If you're getting meddlesome in somebody else's quarrel, it's not your quarrel. It's like you're picking up a dog by the ears. Well, how so? Well, I, I don't know how he meant that. Except the only thing I can think of is I, if I pick up a dog by the ears, that's going to be a mad, uh, that dog's going to be angry at me. <laughs> now, how do I put it down? You know, <laughs> I have to hold those ears to keep it from biting me. How do I let go of it? I'm stuck with it. You know, it's, it's, uh, I'm in a, situation I got into that's hard to easily get and safely get out of. And then you get involved in other people's quarrels when you're not a mediator. In other words, I mean, it, that is your, it is your own quarrel. If they call you in to mediate, if they call you in to counsel them, of course, then, of course, it, this is not what this is. But a lot of times you hear of someone arguing, two people arguing, or you hear of something that's going on, and uh, it's none of your business, but you just get involved. And then, then it's your problem, too. And it, you didn't need it to be. Uh, in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, Paul is talking about the different gifts that people have. 
and how they ought to just just in a sense do what they're supposed to do and i think the subtext is don't worry too much about what someone else is doing if everyone is doing their job then everything will get done but in chapter 12 of romans and verse 6 paul says having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us let us use them if prophecy let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry the serving let us do it in our serving he who teaches in teaching he who exhorts in exhortation he who gives with liberality he who leads with diligence he who shows mercy with cheerfulness basically saying everyone has a different gift just do that do what god has given you to give you know mind your business make sure that you're getting done what god has given you to do and let each other person worry about what they're supposed to do when everybody is doing their job the whole project progresses things get done if you start saying i don't think they're doing as much as i am you know they're not doing as well as i'm doing in their in their duty and their gift as i'm doing in mine well then we're probably not doing as well in ours my friend danny layman again i mentioned him earlier he used to work at a i think it was a mushroom factory in santa cruz when he was a new christian a lot of people who needed jobs were working there big turnover there people working but his his uh, th these flats that mushrooms went in were, were on a conveyor belt and he and a whole bunch of people were online and and there came a time when the flats was under his dispenser or something he'd pull a lever and it would fill up and then the next one he pulled the lever he had to pay attention and i remember he said that there were times when he was wondering if everyone else is doing as well as he is doing he, he looked down the line and as soon as he did uh, one of his flats would go by without getting filled. He, he, he couldn't do his job and uh, watch other people do their job at the same time. And uh, I remember him uh, talking about the lesson he learned from that. But you know, mind your own business. Do well what you're given to do. There are times when other people's business does become your business because they, they either need you to rescue them from a situation that's bigger than they know is and you need to address it or else they ask you in. And then, of course... That's a different story. But when you're not welcomed, uh, just focus on what you're supposed to do and do it well. Another important principle here is in Romans 13, which is close to Romans 12, obviously. Uh, in verse 8, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now, there will be a debt that you cannot repay, and that is to love one another. And the reason you can't repay it is because it's, it's a lifelong debt. You can't pay it off. But most debts can be paid off. Now, he's not saying don't go into debt. It might sound like he is. No, he's, in the context, he's talking about give all their due, honor to whom honor, tribute to whom tribute, taxes to whom taxes, owe no one anyone, means do not leave unpaid some obligation, some debt you have. Settle your account. Uh, it is not a sin to go into debt, although the Bible makes it very clear it's not desirable. The Bible says that the debtor is servant to the lender, and that's not a situation that most of us would prefer to be in. And people, when they get out of debt, they feel very released from that, and that's true. I mean, I recommend living without debt insofar as you can, but it's not a sin to be in debt. I mean, Jesus said, lend to everyone who would borrow from you. Well, isn't that putting them in debt? I think it is. So, I mean, if it's a sin for them to be in debt, you shouldn't do it. Obviously, sometimes people need help and they don't need, they don't just want a gift. They don't want to be beggars. They just need some money up front for them. They can pay it back and they want to pay it back. And, and you should be prepared to do it. It's not a sin. But most debt that we have, uh, of course, is incurred without the necessity of it. I mean, we, we, we want to just elevate our standard of living many times and that and that means we we have to borrow money from a bank or something like that. That's a different situation than they actually had in biblical times. In biblical times, the people who borrowed money were kind of ashamed to do it. They didn't want to, but they, they were poor. They had to, to survive. And so you're supposed to show compassion and lend and not expect anything in return, Jesus said. Now, but if you have become indebted or if you have an obligation of some kind, make sure you have it settled. Debt separates friends. Everyone knows the old joke that if someone's bugging you, lend them money and you'll never have to see them again, you know, <laughs> uh, because it separates people for some reason. 
uh, until you get that paid off, they've got something against you. They may not be angry at you. They may not hate you for it, but they've got something on you that's unresolved until it is resolved. And if you never pay the debt or if you pay late, that often does irritate. That often does cause a problem in the relation. And Jesus mentioned this uh, by implication, uh, not necessarily debt per se, but it applies to settling all your accounts. In, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 23, and everyone knows this passage, uh, if you bring your gift to the altar and remember your brother has something against you, uh, leave your gift at the altar and go settle it with your brother and then bring your gift to the altar. Now, your brother has something against you. That means there's something that needs to be resolved between you and him, and it's on you to do it. It's a different thing if you have something against him. Then, of course, forgiving and so forth is where that kicks in. Your obligation to forgive, to reconcile if you have something against someone else. But if they have something against you, that means you're the, the ball's in your court. It means that there's an unresolved issue that you need to settle between them. And Jesus said, don't even offer your sacrifice in the temple. Don't even worship God if you're neglecting that. That's an important thing because the relationship is important. And if you leave those things unsettled, that is usually uh, going to cause problems. All right. Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to take one more here today. It'll seem really short, I'm sure, because of that. But uh, that way we can uh, take some more the next time. Uh, and that is appreciate diversity instead of being threatened by it. Now, I think we're all 21st century, Southern California, hit cool people. We don't, we're not, you know, we don't have issues with race and gender and things like that. You know, but those are the kind of things that a lot of people historically have. And maybe some people, even that we know, have some of that underlined that they don't talk about or that they, you wouldn't know they had it. But obviously, when people are different from you, even if it's just the opposite sex, or if they're from another country, their culture is different, if their skin color is different, if, if something about them is clearly different from you, I mean, there's different ways you can respond to that. But the, the very foolish and carnal way is to think that person is almost like a different species than me. And we know very well that that's exactly how, for example, black slaves were treated when they were brought here from Africa back in the 1700s and 1800s. And, you know, they were treated as subhuman. Now, not everyone saw them that way. And that's why slavery was ended, because a lot of, you know, white Christians were saying, wait a minute, <laughs> these are people just like us. But when someone, their culture is totally different than you, or they look different than you, or they're, they're different in some you know, unmistakable way, there's always that tendency to feel like they're different. I'm better. You know, if somebody's different, then I'm better. Otherwise, I have to think they're better and I'm worse. And our pride, our arrogance uh, naturally inclines towards saying, well, you know, I can, I can treat that person however the law requires me to treat them or, or, or decency allows me, requires me to treat them, but I still, I'm still better, which is not true. I mean, obviously, we know that's not true. There are some very wicked people in every demographic and some very good people in every demographic. You, you can't judge people by the category that they are in, and you should rather just appreciate the diversity of it. I mean, you know, if there weren't Mexican people around here, we wouldn't have Mexican food, right? And, yeah. and you know, what would we do without that? What would we, what would we do without them? And, uh, you know, it's true. I mean, there's, they have a different culture. I remember once, see, I have some daughters who live in Hollywood, and they're very, very woke. And uh, I once went to a Mexican restaurant with them, and, and all the walls were painted bright colors, different colors and stuff. And I just mentioned, oh, the Mexican people, they, they really like these bright colors. And my girl said, shh, don't say anything about that. You know, like, like I was criticizing them or something. I to me, it's not a criticism. It's you go down to Mexico or you go to Latin America, you'll find the houses are painted bright colors and stuff. That's not a criticism. That's just a cultural difference. It's kind of it's kind of neat. It's kind of neat to go to another country and see people. It looks different than your home. Uh, it's not boring, but you know, it's uh, nowadays it's people are so sensitized. You don't want to mention any differences between any cultures or any races or anything like that. Uh, differences are not necessarily uh, qualitative, you know. They're just, they're just, uh, they're just different. 
and they make life entertaining and pleasant and not, not boring. And we should appreciate that diversity. I remember uh, someone said, you know, Benjamin Franklin in, in Poor Richard's Almanac said, uh, diversity is the spi spice of life, or no, there's a variety. Variety is the spice of life. And the preacher said, and Benjamin Franklin left enough illegitimate children in France to prove he really meant it. But, uh, but the truth is, diversity is uh, a spice of life. Now, when we say appreciate diversity, unfortunately, the word diversity in our modern culture means moral diversity. You know, you know, some people, you know, some guys like other guys, some guys like girls. So that's just diversity. Now, you need if you if you have a problem with that, you need to go through diversity training. You know, sensitivity training. Uh, that's not the kind of diversity we're talking about. We're talking about how God made people different, and even people that he didn't necessarily make different in their cultures, they developed different ways of, of uh, doing things and tastes and things like that. And that can just make life good. But unfortunately, carnal people have more of a tendency to feel threatened by someone who's different. I don't think, I think growing up in California and so forth, we don't, probably don't have much of that. I, I wouldn't think. But there certainly is plenty of it in the world. There's plenty of it. And it's not all racial, and it's not all about gender, and it, it's, it's, it's cultural or other things, you know. Um, even, even how much people weigh and things like that, you know. Now, I have to say this, that uh, some things are lifestyle related, and sometimes you can't help but make judgments about the results of lifestyle choices. But when we're talking about things that are immutable or things that are just cultural, that don't, don't have, they're neither good nor bad, then of course we should learn to appreciate that. And does the Bible say that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what Paul says, for example, in Romans 12, uh, 4 through 5, and also in 1 Corinthians 12. In Romans, he says, So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Okay. Uh, or I should have read the verse before that too. That was verse 5. Verse 4 says, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Paul goes into that same discussion uh, much more at length in 1 Corinthians 12. Both Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 is where we find Paul listing different gifts and making the same point about it. The diversities of gifts have to do with uh, functions. And he says in um, chapter uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 12, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into the spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the smelling be? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if, he were, if they were all one member, where would the body be? So, and he goes on to talk about the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, and the head cannot say to the foot, I have no need of you. These members of the body are different from each other by nature. By design, they're different. And they're designed for different purposes. And that's a diversity that does not have to cause disunity. Uh, unity is not the same thing as uniformity. Diversity is a good thing. God built it. God could have made us all complete bodies and we wouldn't need each other. We wouldn't, our gifts wouldn't have to supplement the gifts of others in order to make the whole thing happen. But they do. And, and yet many people, even, in, even when it comes to judging ministries, you know, I've, I've heard some people who go to a, a denomination where they teach verse by verse through the Bible, which is their denomination's trademark. I've heard them criticize other churches that were doing pretty well, but they, they, oh, but they, don't, they don't teach verse by verse through the Bible. Well, as far as I know, Jesus didn't either. Or Paul. I don't know of any apostle who, sat, you know, who taught verse by verse through the Bible. Certainly. I mean, Jesus didn't use King James. Oh, come on. 
Let's not blaspheme here. <laughs> no, you're right. He probably didn't use King James. I'm going to have to admit that. And, uh, you know, churches do things differently. Uh, people who are evangelistic. You ever know someone who's really an on-fire evangelist who thinks there's something wrong with you because you're not out on the street evangelizing? Or somebody who's got a healing ministry who thinks everyone should be doing healing ministry? Uh, or people who uh, who protest, protest in front of uh, abortion clinics and they think if you don't do that, uh, you're not serving God. You know, you're compromised. You're and and yet, God calls some people and gives them this gives them this passion to do a certain thing, and it's a good thing He does because someone has to do it. Mm-hmm. But if everyone was doing that, then who's going to do the other things? You know, there's a lot of things we've done. I, Keith Green, who was not very balanced, he was. I, I loved him. He was a great man. He's still one of my favorites. Uh, in the music world, although he's dead many years, but he he got it in his head that everyone should become a missionary uh, shortly before he died. And uh, he got in, you know, he, he began to see what YWAM was doing. He got real excited about Youth with a Mission. And he began to write and speak at his concert and say, you know, the last command we got from God, from Jesus before he left was go into all the world. And if you haven't got a, you know, a stronger command to stay home, you better go, you know, I mean, as if the default of all, of all Christian duty is to go out on the mission field. That's not the default. That's for the people who are called to do it. Paul and Barnabas did it. Paul and Silas did it. Apart from them, we don't know of any missionaries that the Church of Antioch sent out, and they were the most missionary-minded church in the, old, in the, in the New Testament. So, you know, I'd rather see a, a mission field populated with 100 guys like the Apostle Paul than 100,000 people who are immature, not called, not gifted, and they're just there because someone guilted them into going on the mission field. Uh, and there are people like that. Uh, not everyone's called to be a foreign missionary. But when someone is, they often, not always, but some of them will just talk like, you know, shouldn't you consider being a missionary? Shouldn't everyone consider being a missionary? Um, I remember when I started my school in Oregon, I thought, well, everyone should teach the Bible. I mean, the Bible says for the time you ought to be teachers, you need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God in Hebrews chapter 5 there. And, uh, well, everyone should be a teacher. So I just thought, I'll just bring in the students and I'll teach them everything I know and then they can go out and be teachers like me. Turns out that some people very smart, some smarter than me, went through the school and learned a great deal, but they weren't teachers. They, that just wasn't their gift. They, their brains were perfectly good and they were not inarticulate, but they just weren't gifted to teach. Because not everyone has that gift. We should appreciate the fact that some people aren't gifted as we are, uh, but they are gifted in ways we're not. And, you know, the diversity shouldn't cause division. I think the reason we have so many denominations is because people think for themselves, which we should, but other people who don't think the same way are threatened by the difference of opinion. I think when I meet people with an interesting difference of opinion, I want to spend more time with them. I want to find out... What are you thinking? How'd they get that idea? You know, I mean, instead of being frightened by diversity, instead of being put off by it or judgmental of someone because they are different or think different, uh, frankly, I, I think that kind of makes life interesting. If everyone here agreed with me completely, uh, eventually it'd get very boring. Um, so diversity is often a cause of division, but diversity is not by nature, disunifying, because the members of your body are diverse from each other, but they function together as one unit, and that's what Paul used as the metaphor for Christians, you know, getting along with others and working together with others who don't have the same functions. Um, So those are some of the things related to living peaceably with people, you know, put other people's needs uh, ahead of your own uh, when you can, think the best of people, you know, cut off the tail of the tail bear when you hear gossip. Get them to stop. Make them stop in your presence anyway. Mind your own business instead of getting nosing, nosing into everybody else's. Uh, settle your outstanding accounts because until that happens, there's somebody holding something against you. They may not be angry at you, but they're still holding the debt or the, whatever it is. They might be angry at you too if you, you should have settled before. And appreciate diversity. We're going to stop at that point. There's more on the list, but we'll take those next time. Thank mm-hmm. you.